Uh, it's good to hear that good work that you're doing in India. I grew up in Charlotte, and uh, uh, so I grew up in Charlotte. Charlotte in my early 20s, 20s, left for a long time, and been back the last six years. And uh, it's amazing to me, and I tell people this all the time, the world is coming to us. Yes. If you look around, uh, the people that, that I come in contact with and that I'm able to share the gospel with are Buddhist and Hindu t uh, people, and uh, great to go there. And it's also cool, cool that uh, all these people from all over the world are coming here. Because when I grew up, it wasn't like this. There wasn't this kind of diversity. And uh, you have uh, Arabic people, um, you have uh, Southeast Asians, on and on. And um, so many challenges, so many opportunities. The good thing here is, and right now, at least we got a lot more opportunity and freedom to share the gospel, right? Yeah. So uh, that's a good way of um, thinking about it. Uh, so I'm excited about that conference on the Bible, man. I love the Bible. We're going to talk about that this morning. Uh, I was hoping you could get... Beanie Hen or someone like that in there. <laughs> Dude, that man's anointed. Holy Spirit's all over him. Or Joel Osteen or somebody. But uh, those, those four will do. Um, is, that, you, is that a joke? Uh, is that a joke? Yeah. <laughs> I'll leave it to your, uh, your own judgment on that. For some people, you know. All right. <laughs> so I preached a great sermon last week. Where were you guys? <laughs> I don't have a good sermon this week, but I had a great one last week. And I was here, and I was the only one here, and I preached it anyhow. Usually when people find out I'm preaching, the, the attendance is low, but that was extreme. <laughs> but, uh, no, that was, that, that was cool. So uh, we're... Um, we had to uh, we had to take a hiatus there. So um, a couple weeks ago, Brian sent out an email, and uh, he said that we would have to have a Christmas party uh, here rather than in our home because no one really had room for that. So um, so we had a Christmas party Thursday. And there were a lot of people here, and he was right. <laughs> None of our homes could have could have had all those people in it. It was just too many folks. That's a good problem to have, but we had to do it here. And uh, so none of our homes, we really could not have uh, uh, prepared any of our homes for the amount of people that were here from our church and, and our, our guests as well. So, um, and that's okay. But one thing this Christmas season that we should have room for and that we should prepare room for is Him. So that's what this series here, Prepare Him Room in Your Home. See what I did there with the uh, prepare room there? <laughs> That's all the funny stuff I got. Okay. Prepare him. Thank you. Someone said thank you. Okay. So I got on my notes here. Build rapport. Done. Done. Done and done. We're in this message. Prepare him room in your home. And you were pointing here. And then the, um, the little knob on the, on the bottom raises and lowers it. Okay. No, no, it's, it's maxed out. It's maxed out, yeah. This is short even for me. And this morning my message is prepare him room in your home. We're in the series prepare him room. Uh, last uh, message it was prepare him room in your heart. And then uh, next Sunday is going to be prepare him room in your church. Yeah. So uh, that's where we're at in our, our series here. So uh, how do we prepare him room in our homes? I just have two very simple thoughts for you this morning. Um, and it's going to be kind of a back and forth discussion between us. Hopefully I can get a little bit of your involvement. Uh, but how do we prepare him room in our home? My answers here are not complete, but they're a good start for us this morning. I think we prepare him room in our homes by uh, teaching his words. Through his word. We make room through his word. And secondly, by following his example of submission. That is, bringing biblical order to our home. So those two things of, of inviting and bringing the word of God into our homes, the gospel, and bringing biblical order to our homes, I think those are two good starting places for the idea of preparing him room in our homes. And so uh, with that here, let's go ahead and start here in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 
Deuteronomy chapter 6. Every now and then we get to the Old Testament. We're, we're, we're a Baptist church, but we, we do believe in the Old Testament. So uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 says here, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Man, this is the great confession, the great tenet of uh, ancient Judaism. Uh, it's called the Shema uh, passage, uh, commonly, because the Greek, uh, the Hebrew word Shema means here. And so we know that the uh, first century observant Jew would say this uh, at least twice a day. He would recite it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Shema Yisrael. Uh, Yahweh Eloheinu, uh, Yahweh Echad. And they would say that over and over and over again uh, because of its importance. They had documents where they would record the Ten Commandments, and the only thing beside the Ten Commandments that they would have here is Deuteronomy 6, 4, uh, maybe uh, 5 and 6. So it was very important to them. It's the central tenet. Uh, it, it encapsulates the law here. And so what he says here is, Hear, O Israel, listen. The word can also be translated obey. Hear what I'm about to say and obey it and believe it and do it. The Lord, that is Yahweh, He is our God. And the Lord is one. So a lot of uh, talk and a lot of ink is spilt over this, this last bit here, the Lord is one. And there's a lot of different ways of looking at it, but basically it tells us two things. There's one God, one true God, and that one true God is the only God for Israel. There's one unique God, and Israel should not worship any other of the, of the false gods. And so what, what Moses is doing here, he's given the Ten Commandments, and now he's given an exposition of the Ten Commandments, if you will. What's at the heart of it? What's at the root of it? When Jesus was asked, you know, what is the greatest commandment, he started with this one. He said, love the Lord your God. That's the greatest commandment. So this is more of a uh, Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2 where it says to uh, submit our bodies as living sacrifices. And what he's saying here in verse 5 is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, your whole being. Yeah, you see? And so it's, the, it's, a, it's a very much about love. That's what Deuteronomy is about, love. If there's, a, if there's the Old Testament counterpart to the Gospel of John and John's letters, the, uh, the apostle of love they call John, is Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy has the word love more than any other book in the Old Testament by far. It is the book of love. And so that's the heart of the law, to love God and to be faithful to Him. And so he says you love God, you start with your heart, that seat of your emotion, your will, uh, and your thinking. And, and so what uh, Moses is saying is all these external things, man begins in the heart. When people look at the Old Testament and they say, well, that was an external religion, but then you get to the heart of the religion in the New Testament. No, that's not true. That's a caricature. The reality here is it's a very heartfelt, deep, internal, <laughs> coming from the insides of the person to the outside. That's how, that's how Moses said you can have this covenant faithfulness in your heart. And uh, it's the same for us today. And so what Moses says here is love with your heart, your soul, with all your might. So starting with the heart, your soul, and then your outer person. All that you are, that's the idea. So, so there's only one that you worship, and that's God, because He is the true God. And this one God, you worship Him with your whole self. What a powerful statement of discipleship. The whole person for one God, and Him and Him alone. And so he says here, this is, this is how he begins ex, the explication, the exposition of the Ten Commandments. And here's what he adds to this, to this great truth. He says in verse 6, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So, I mean, one way is to take this very literal, but I think as you read Deuteronomy, 
and it talks about this internalization uh, of, of, of the covenant of, of God's word in, in people's hearts. Um, I don't think either this is literal. I don't think he's telling them to really do this. Now, in Second Temple Judaism, they did be, have those phylacteries, those things they wrap around their arms and little boxes and those kind of things. But what he's saying here is these words, not just what he just said, but the words he had given in the previous chapters, they are to be on your heart and you are to have them everywhere in your home. Uh, when, wherever you go and whatever you do and wherever you are. And so it's really about saturating your home with the Word of God. And so he says, teach. So this is where we get our first point from. Verse 7. Teach them diligently to your children. And that will help make room this Christmas for Him. So our application of this passage has to be in the, in the light of biblical theology. A few things we should consider. Is, first is that all Scripture is God-breathed. We know that from 2 Timothy 3.16. So what he's saying here about the law, the Torah, is true of all, all of Scripture. No one can read uh, um, the Gospel of Matthew and not realize that Matthew is making the point that Jesus is presenting a new Torah, if you will, the Messiah's Torah. And uh, then we also take into consideration the fact that when Christ gave His commission at the end of Matthew, He said for them to go and make disciples of all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but then to teach them to observe all things I have commanded you. And so there's the command to teach what Messiah had taught, at least in the Gospel of Matthew, and starting there. And so the Torah of Christ, the teachings of Christ, are a commandment to teach. Scripture speaks of Christ and all of it leads up to Him. We know that from Luke 24. On the Emmaus Road, He said, all the, all the, prophets, all, all the prophets speak of Him. And that key to the Old Testament is given to us in Luke 24. So all this tells us this. What Moses is saying here about the law is true about the Gospel about all of God's Word. And that's what we should be teaching to our, to our children. These are Gospel truths. Look at verses 20 and 20, uh, 20 through 25. I'll read, all, I'll read all of this. 20 through 25. I don't want to get out my glasses, but I might have to. Let's see. When your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us up out of, the, of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders and great and grievous uh, against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before uh, our eyes. Verse 24. The Lord has commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that He might preserve us alive as we are today. It's about redemption. It's about, it's about, it's about the gospel. And so even there, Moses is pointing to redemption as the reason why. We know from Romans 10, 17 that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. People in our home need to hear the gospel. They need to hear these words. There's lots of good wisdom and words that you and I can give our children. But there's nothing I can say to my son and my wife. There are no words that I have that can compare to these words. My words ain't as good as these words. i got to give them the best, and the best is this. So I'm really excited about that uh, conference that we're going to have that focuses on the Word of God. That's where it all starts. So what we're talking about here goes well beyond putting scriptures on our wall, having scripture screen savers and Bibles on coffee tables. This is about a saturation of the gospel. It's about bringing God's word and weaving it into the fabric of our family life. That's how we make him room, to bring his word, the word of the gospel, the word of God in our homes. I don't know about you, but practical examples help me a lot. How do we take this very um, theoretical and make it practical? So I'm going to share with you a few things that I do. Um, you probably do better things. I like to hear about them. 
So I'm going to share a few things and I'm going to ask you guys to share a few things that uh, could be helpful as well. So I just want to share a few things that help me to bring gospel um, the way that Moses is talking about here. When I sit up and when I lie down and on the doorposts of my house and everywhere. So at mealtime, um, of course, that's a wonderful time to share the gospel. That's a wonderful time to bring this book out. In fact, this is my mealtime Bible. And uh, being a fast eater helps me a lot because, <laughs> because then I can finish what I'm doing and then, and then I'll go get the Bible and we'll, we'll read uh, the scripture. And right before I do, I always quote Matthew 4.4. 4. Uh, Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I usually don't get to say it, though, unless Elijah just got something in his mouth because he always beats me to it. So as soon as I push away my food, he, he says, Daddy, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And I said, you're right. Let's go get it. And, uh, you know, I know people are busy. I'm busy. Not as busy as some of you guys. But one of the things I've taught my family is that if we're so busy that we can't pray and, and, and just read a little bit of the Word of God, then we're too busy to eat. And so we'll just fast and do this. Because this is more important than anything we put in our bodies, right? So if we if we got time to eat, we got time for the word and prayer. If we don't have time for that, then for us, that's not a rule for everybody. That's a rule just for us. And uh, then, then this is more important. And we got the we got the opportunity of bringing out the scriptures on these little things. You don't have to carry around a big clunky Bible. Look at that. We can have the Bible on our phones, right? And so if we're out um, we're out in a restaurant or something, I can whip out the Bible and I do it. And uh, we, have, we have a scripture discussion there. Movie nights. Uh, every now and then my family has movie nights. And uh, it's very interesting because if we have an hour and a half movie, that could easily turn into a three hour uh, movie. Because dad's got the remote control in his hand. And every time we come to something, dad stops it. And we have a little talk about what we just, what we just saw. You know? Uh, and you would think this would destroy uh, the uh, experience. But my family loves it, especially Elijah. Uh, he loves to talk about what we had just seen, and he loves to relate it to what God says in his word. And so we quote scripture about what we had just seen that agrees with or disagrees with it. Uh, we bring out the scripture, the Bible itself, if we can't remember where it's from. So we bring God's word. We bring God to the movies with us, if you will. And we just weave that into the whole thing. Um, because uh, it becomes a wonderful point of departure for discussions about what God says in His Word. So that's a great thing to do. Um, and we go from God's Word. For instance, we look at some, some kind of sin that we see on TV. Someone lied, okay? And I asked Elijah, what, com what commandment is that? And he tells me, and I said, well, how did God deal with sin? And then all of a sudden, we're into the Gospel. And we quote, we quote passages from the, from the Gospel and the Epistles. When I'm tenting in the backyard or outdoors with, uh, with my family, quote Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, right? And uh, we'll talk about Colossians 1 and, and Hebrews 1, which talks about everything was made by Him and through Him and for Him, right? And He upholds everything by His powerful Word in Hebrews 1, right? So we're already brought into the Gospel again. And then there's just plain memorization work. Elijah has a whole folder of, of verses, dozens of verses that he's memorizing. He's very good. It's amazing young minds can remember things so quickly. And when they remember, and you, you're helping them memorize these things, guess what? You feel challenged because you don't know, you haven't memorized some of those, and then the whole family becomes a part of it. But then the hardest teaching is to teach by modeling. Because the emphasis in God's word is to do it. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. That we may do it over and over again. So, we read in 1 Thessalonians 1, 17, where Paul talks about the Thessalonians. He says, You became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And so when we do things in accordance to the Scriptures, we become a model, an example to our children, and that's a teaching example of what God says in His Word. Uh, a simple thing like the other couple weeks ago, we were dropping some food off for our family at our church. You guys do more of this than we do. And when we did that, that was a teaching moment, right? Why, why, why is Daddy and, and why is Mommy, why are we doing these things, right? 
So this is an opportunity to bring the gospel into that conversation. I know that I can do better than this, but I'd be interested to hear from you guys some of the things that you do in your home that bring the gospel and the word of God into your home in a way that what Moses is talking about here, just bring it into the fabric of your family and everyday activities. Because I didn't come up with this stuff. I learned this stuff over time from other people who did that. I was like, that's a good idea. Why well, not think of reading my Bible at my because <laughs> I didn't grow up that way. Do you guys have any family practices that would help me? Um, I thought it was funny that you mentioned the movie thing because we thought that wasn't meant to be funny. We, well, <laughs> we, I honestly thought we were the only family that did that. Like, uh, you know, my dad started it growing up forever, and he would watch something. Probably like, where I got it from. Well, this is. Probably. Uh, you know, related to the gospel or here's blah, blah, blah. And so then we started doing it on our own. We would go to the movies and then we would look at each other and be like, that's not right. Or, you know, or here's how you can put that and relate it to the gospel and like that. So, I mean, we do that at our home. That's awesome. That's good. <laughs> you're like me. You're awesome. <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, you know, the, the normal cycle of life goes on. We don't finish this journey with our children, right? Now, and then they go on. And, and what, how are they going to pass on their children? What kind of habits? And are they going to have a Christian worldview? And they're going to engage everything they see in that way? And you have that apparatus, that ability now to... Kind of second nature to you now to think that way and do that, isn't it? Yeah, we just, um, you know, being a busy family and all that, uh, anytime there's sin... Whether it's mine or somebody's in the family, we just say, "All right, you know, I'll, I'll kind of call time out. And we'll just talk about it." Because uh, what I found is, if if you don't talk about it, it, it's kind of left festering. It becomes something far worse. Yeah. But as we talk about sin, we talk about how sin was dealt with, <clears throat> and then uh, it always leads to the gospel. Just, just kind of that walking day by day, or whatever portion of that scripture, just through the moments of life. You know, just call the time out and talking about who God is, what He's done. Yeah, that's been an intentional thing, though, right? I mean, we have to stop and say, okay, we're going to have to deal with it in a second. How am I going to bring this? It's easy to go from sin to the Savior. But, but repeat, repeat the question. Oh, I'm just looking for a um, place to stand where I'm not making noise. <laughs> I'm just looking for practical ideas. So, like, uh, no, they bring the word. Mothers, the nursing mothers. The nursing mothers room. Oh yeah. So you want me to restate what I yeah. the question? Re yeah. Re restate the question from from here. Okay. So I, my question, my question was, what kind of practical <laughs> ideas do you have that, 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 that you uh, practice in your family that uh, uh, bring the word of God uh, to bear on just the the mundane things of everyday life? Uh, and everywhere we go. And then repeat his his what he, he said. <laughs> okay, so um, basically what Pastor Brian was saying was uh, when there's a sin in his family, he calls a timeout and says, hey, this is, um, this is something we need to deal with and um, deal with in a biblical way and then talk about it from a gospel perspective, if I summarize that right. Yeah, good. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I need to be to I think that sometimes it's good. Sometimes we look back on just the blessings of that day and all the things that we don't deserve but we're given um, just in that day or week or whenever we just have a time of thanks. Yeah. yeah awesome. Repeat the question. <laughs> Here's a, uh, just stops that has a time of thanks. Yeah. Okay, no more audience input because this is uh, double time and there's so much. Jim, thank you though, man. Yeah, no, we, don't want, we don't want to leave those people out. Is anybody in that room? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there. All right, I'm, I'm shutting you guys down because I don't want to say that anymore. <laughs> but uh, share with us if you have anything through our group here or personally here. But all of this presupposes that we know the, God, the Word of God internally. Look at verse 6. Again. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. They will be upon your heart. This is used in the Old Testament in several ways, but basically it means it's an internal thing from the core of who we are. Uh, it, 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 it's um, similar to what the phrases that we read in Psalm 1, that blessed man, all right? His delight is in the law of the Lord. 
And on his law, he meditates day and night. The word meditate there means to chew, to go over and over and over again. And so it's, uh, it's really about memorization and whether it's in our hearts. We don't always have the opportunity to go through the whole Bible to find what we want. So if we're going to be good teachers and disciples in our home, we got to have some of the Word of God upon our hearts, right? And that means upon our minds. So we got to know it. When I was in my early 20s, I memorized the book of Romans. I've never memorized a, a book of the Bible since then. Uh, but this year, uh, you can do it with me. I'm going to try to memorize the book of Hebrews. And uh, I want to have that so that I can use that in the moment. We can memorize various passages and little verses of Scripture here and there. But uh, that Word of God it can't be used if, if we don't know it, right? Amen. But it's going to be upon our hearts. So, so one of the things we've got to ask ourselves as parents, moms and dads, uh, if we're going to have this kind of gospel-saturated, uh, word-saturated type of home that Moses is describing here, do we have the ability to do so? And so wherever we're at, we need to start memorizing Scripture, meditating on Scripture. You meditate on it, you memorize it. That's a byproduct. And uh, we'll have that to give to our children and to share in the moment. So I guess the first thing, if we're going to prepare him room in our home, I guess one of the most practical and basic and most you know, basic thing that we can do is to uh, bring his word, bring the word of the gospel into our homes in a way that will hopefully make this Christmas not about something else, but what it should be about. Uh, I told Elijah, Christmas is about four words in John 1.14. The Word became flesh. And, uh, you know, it is about a baby in a manger. It is about Jesus' birthday. But we're even more concerned about what took place nine months earlier. Because that changed everything. That's the miracle of all miracles. The infinite becomes finite. That which is spirit became flesh. And John says in so strong of a terms, he didn't take on humanity so much. But he also became flesh. You don't get any more, you know, emphatic than that. And so that's the word that they need to hear. So the second thing that we can do to prepare him room in our homes is how am I doing on time, Crystal? Five minutes. Oh, for the thirty minute mark. Well, I got plenty of time then. Okay, we prepare him room in our homes when we follow his example of submission. Uh, we bring biblical order to our to our home. And I'll read you that passage here in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. <clears throat> Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body as he himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands, you should love their, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife uh, see that she respects her husbands. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. That is the first commandment with a promise. That they may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. So, any time we preach on this, I mean, it's a very sensitive thing. I understand, especially in our climate. <coughs> the culture at large, and actually the church climate as well. Um, I remember a cartoon of a pastor who was up, came up to the pulpit and uh, he was reading um, from this passage, verse 22, Wives submit to your own husbands. And, and around the pulpit he had all these sandbags and, and, and he was all guarded up here, you know, um, because uh, he knew what was coming. All right? Well, 
I, I think people take this sometimes to to speak of uh, oppression or I don't know somehow demeaning uh, to women and children uh, but it's far from the truth this is a beautiful picture of the gospel it is a wonderful gift that God is giving us order it's not oppression to women or children and it doesn't in any way even imply inferiority but it's by the relationship between Christ and the church it's by the relationship that we see in the Trinity it's by the expression of the gospel of Jesus Christ remember that Christ models submission he is our example right Luke 2.51 says, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, Nazareth and was submissive to them. So he was submissive to someone who was really his inferior, if anything. 1 Corinthians 15.28 says, When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under his feet, uh, under him, that God may be all in all. And so here, Jesus Christ is being subjected or submissive to the Father. Does that mean that Jesus is less than the Father in any way? No. There's no inferiority. In the Trinity, there's order without inferiority. 1 Corinthians 11.3 says, But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. So everybody's got a head. <laughs> But I think that this idea of submission is probably one of the most Christ-like characteristics that we can pursue. In my book, in my understanding, all these Christ-like characteristics fall under three categories of love, uh, humility, and holiness. And uh, I think submission is part of that. And so we read here in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So Christ in his humility becomes human. That's what we're celebrating this Christmas. And then he goes further than that and serves. And further than that, he goes to a, a horrible, shameful death on the cross. So he is submissive to, to the Father's plan and how he has sent him. And so that submission doesn't imply inferiority. That submission brings about the salvation that God always planned. Because Jesus went to that cross, he died on that cross, and he paid for our sin, he took our place, he took the wrath of God for us, and we got his righteousness. That's the gospel. So out of the submission, in the Trinity, in the plan of salvation, comes the gospel itself. And when we manifest, when we express that in our homes, that's a God-honoring thing. That's a gospel thing. That's a, a wonderful thing. So nothing more Christ-like than submission. Submission with order. It reflects the Trinity. It reflects the church and Christ relationship. Now it says here in verse 21, it says, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then Paul begins to explain what he means by that. Paul doesn't mean everyone submit to everyone else indiscriminately. It is a discriminating type of submission that he's talking about here. So he begins here in verse 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands. In fact, the Greek word submit is not even in verse 22. It comes from verse 21. Translators of the English put the word submit in there because it's understood. Because Paul is giving an explanation of what he means when he says submitting to one another. The one to the other, he says, let me tell you what I'm talking about. I'm saying wives, submit to your own husbands. So that's the order that he places there. So um, I feel like I need some sandbags right up here right about now. <laughs> no, I think, you, I think we are all on the same page on this, I hope. And... Someone has compared it not to a struggle, but to a beautiful dance, this kind of order. Someone has said the waltz, and I don't, I don't do the waltz, but the, the man leads. Kids, come on, demonstrate the waltz up here for me. The man leads, and, and the woman, uh, as he takes a step, she takes a step, and so on and so forth. And so it's not, uh, when it's that way, 
uh, when the man leads and the woman follows in submission, then it's a beautiful dance. It's a beautiful thing. It expresses the gospel. It's not about imp uh, oppression. It's not about inferiority. Uh, it's about the gospel. And it's a beautiful thing. So in conclusion, um, these are the two things that I think will help us and get us along the way of preparing him room in our home. And just a balance of all of this, I would just say, not a first point, but a balance to all this, all this focus on our family, as, as we should have in, in our, our lives, is remember that um, Jesus is more important even than our family. Jesus said, who are my mother and my brothers? The one who does the will of God. He, he radically reoriented who, the fan, who his family is around, around that covenant relationship. And Jesus said, hey, you've got to hate your mother and your father and your brother and sister. You've got to hate your family uh, uh, compared to your love for me. He wasn't saying that we need to hate our family, but he's saying in comparison to allegiance to him, uh, we need to uh, 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 hate our family. And so he wasn't saying hate our family, but what he was saying in comparison, to use a, a very um, strong comparison, is to say that allegiance to me is unrivaled. Okay? And so... When we celebrate this Christmas, and if we're serious about making room for Him in our home, okay, then a, a house full of family cannot displace the one whom it is about. It's about the Word becoming flesh. And as important as this family is, uh, Jesus is more important. And so, the Word became flesh. That will help us make room for Him uh, this Christmas. So we prepare him room by teaching his words in our home. And we follow his example of submission and biblical order. And this is how we help make room. So we're not talking about the veneer of Christianity. We're talking about preparing room for Christ this Christmas. Christ is not in a manger, as uh, Jade said, today. He's at the right hand of God. Amen. He's in the place of power. There's a man on the seat of the universe running it. His name is Jesus Christ. I know that man. And yet he's always Emmanuel, God with us, isn't he? We want him to be with us this Christmas season, but so much of the season crowds out Christ in Christmas. But we can prepare room in our homes, starting with the kind of things that we had talked about here this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Your word is light. It is a lamp to our feet is living and active in power and sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, it is sweeter than honey. Uh, it is the truth. Um, and we thank you, Lord, for this word that gives guidance and instruction to us. I pray that this uh, Christmas that the word become flesh will be the center of our attention in all of this, Lord. You wouldn't get crowded out. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that you came to us because we certainly cannot come to you but Lord, I pray that in our homes we will behold the wonder of the incarnation, uh, the God-man, uh, and um, the miracle of all miracles. So I pray that will be center, forefront, in all we say and do. I pray that uh, our other allegiances, if you will, will not crowd out that one central truth and that act of worship uh, that we owe you, Lord. And so, Lord, uh, we also pray that there will be biblical order to our homes in a way that pleases you and honors you. Um, um, pray that uh, we as men will be uh, loving leaders and honor you, Lord. We thank you for these things. I thank you for our church, Lord. Um, Lord, we just love you because you first loved us. And we pray that you'll be with us as we continue in worship here this morning. And um, Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, who doesn't um, know the, the love and the power and the transforming grace of the gospel in his life, I pray that today would be the day that they would come, and that even now, Father, you would draw them. So we ask all these things in the mighty name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, our High Priest, and our soon-coming King. In his name we pray. Amen.